Hello? Yes, now I think it's working. So, there are a few things to let you know at the beginning. One is, up there, across from the headphones table, headset table, we have GNU stickers, which are gratis. And we're going to have some more in GNU stickers in a few minutes. So please take stickers and put them in permanent places where people will see them. And that way they will help the cause of free software and GNU. Also up there, but further to the right, there are people who are selling GNU merchandise. And if you leave before this is over, please stop off there and see if you'd like to get something. We also accept donations of any size. <clears throat> if you would like to take a photo of me, here are a couple of conditions. First, don't ever put a photo in which I appear into Facebook, Instagram, or WhatsApp, because those are three tentacles of a surveillance monster, which exists to track people and where they go and what they do. Well, Facebook can recognize people by their faces or the backs of their heads. So if you put a photo that shows me into that monster, you are helping it track me. And that's treating me very badly, so please don't ever do that. And I hope you will not do it to your friends either, because that's not the way to treat a friend. In fact, the best thing is, you should stop being used by Facebook. Facebook does not have users. Facebook has useds. Don't be one. And friends, don't encourage friends to be used by Facebook. Please, don't ask me questions now. If you have, if you ask, if you want clarification of what I meant by something, then ask right away. Otherwise, please wait till the end. The second thing about photos is, if you want to take a photo with a mobile device, please remember that they put the geolocation in the metadata of the photo, and then if you distribute that photo in any fashion, it helps track people. So before you take a photo of me with a mobile device, turn off geolocation in the metadata. In Android, you can do that with a parameter in the camera app. I don't know how you do that in iMonsteros. <laughs> but I hope you don't have an iMonster. That's because, uh, you know, Android is pretty bad and iMonsters are worse. <clears throat> Finally, if you want to make a recording of the talk, please, and you want to distribute copies, please do it only in formats that are supported by free software. So if it works in VLC, I guess that's good enough. Uh, and please make sure though, and this is, takes more care, make sure that the distribution website permits anybody to download a copy without DRM and without requiring the downloader to run any non-free software. So don't use YouTube. In YouTube, if you visit YouTube in a browser and you don't run the non-free JavaScript code that it invisibly sends to your browser, you see a blank window. Nothing works at all. So please don't distribute my speech through YouTube or any other site which has that kind of problem. Make sure it works with JavaScript deactivated, or at least that it works with LibreJS, and that way you'll be sure that you are not asking people to run a non-free program to see my speech. How ironic that is when people do that. 
because they're asking people to do, to see my speech, exactly the thing that my speech says you should never do. And finally, please put on the recording the Creative Commons No Derivatives License because it's a presentation of my point of view. A technical presentation has to be livery, but a point of view statement does not have to be livery. That's my philosophy about licensing. Now, free software, among one of the things free software will do is protect you from certain kinds of surveillance. Because with free software, if you're if they're trying to surveil you through your own computer, you can change the software so it will lie about you or say nothing or whatever. And we do that because surveillance is really bad. But that's not the only way surveillance works in the digital world. When I got here, they asked me to give my fingerprint. I was shocked. I said, I will not, because I never do. If there's a country that says, give your fingerprint to enter his country, I don't go there. Or I find a way around it. Tomorrow, I'm going to Argentina. I am not going to fly to Buenos Aires. Because if you fly into Buenos Aires, they demand your fingerprints. And I won't do that, so I don't go. But we discovered that if you cross by land from Foz do Iguazu to Puerto Iguazu, you don't, they don't ask you for fingerprints. So I can travel that way. Demanding your fingerprints is treating you as a criminal. And I think you'll find that for the most part, laws to do that were introduced by governments that didn't respect human rights. So if they hadn't let me in without giving my fingerprint, I wouldn't be speaking to you right now because you'd have to point a gun at me to make me do that. I hope you will do the same. It's wrong to demand people's fingerprints for an activity. And if enough of you say, you know, you mustn't do that again, I think they'll change their policy. I haven't had a chance to discuss it with them. I don't know why all of a sudden that's happening, but it must not happen again. And whatever the reason is, they say, because we did X, Y, and Z, we have to demand fingerprints. Tell them, well, then don't demand X, Y, and Z, and I'll come. The community needs to respond and put a stop to this whenever it shows up. Of course, when the government does it, then you have to do it through political action. Could you people hear me? Okay, she says I have to speak closer to the microphone and I'll try to do that, but I hope Raise your hand if you heard what I was saying until now. Okay, at least most people could. I guess you couldn't. <laughs> or else you got better things for your hands to do. Anyway, <clears throat> now back on to, onto the topic of free software. So in English, the word free is ambiguous. It means livre and it means gratis. But when I say it, it means livre, always. I never use the English word free to mean gratis. I say the English word gratis, which means gratis. Because I want people to be completely sure which one I mean. It's clearer in Portuguese. If you say software livre, then it's obvious. It's clear you're talking about the user's freedom, and that's absolutely essential. You see, I don't think it's important whether you pay money to get a copy of a program 
or you receive it gratis. That's a minor detail. I'm not against selling things. Why should I be against selling a copy of a free program? I'm not against it. Because what really matters is not how you get a copy. It's once you have a copy, what do you have? How does it treat you? Does it respect your freedom or does it take your freedom away? So free software is software that respects the user's freedom and community. And that's why it's an important issue. <clears throat> but what is a program and what is a computer? A computer is a universal computing engine. But conceptually, it's very simple. It only does one thing, get the next instruction and do whatever that says. And then again, get the next instruction and do whatever that says, and get the next instruction and do what that says, and the next and the next. Millions of times per second, it will get an instruction and do what that says. The instructions come from a program. So depending on what instructions are in that program, it will make the same computer do this or that or that or that. In fact, the right program can make that computer do anything at all, except for the impossible things. There are some things we can't make a computer do. But for the, th for the things that are possible, depending on the program that the cr computer is running, it will do any of the possible things. So the question is, who gives the instructions to your computer? You might think it's you, when really it's someone else. <laughs> you might think your computer obeys you, when really it's obeying its true master all the time. And it does something you ask for when its true master says to do it. So the true master is always ultimately in control. These are injustice. With any program, there are two possibilities. Either the users control the program or the program controls the users. It's always one or the other because there's no other way it could be. When the users control the program, that's free software. Why? Well, what is freedom? Freedom means con having control of your own life, control of the activities you do in your life. But if you use a program to do the activity, control of the activity requires control of that program. So when the users control the program, it respects their freedom and community, so it's free software. Practically speaking, in order for the users to have control of the program, they need the four essential freedoms. Freedom zero is to run the program any way you wish for any purpose. Freedom one is to study the source code of the program and change it so that it does your computing activity the way you wish. <clears throat> Why do we insist on source code? Well, on the left is some source code. It's like a mixture of English and math. If you have learned that programming language, you can read the code, see what it does, and change it to do what you want. To run it, we turn it into executable code, which you can see on the right. It's a series of, of ones and zeros, which is not Thanks. Are all the stickers there? Yes, all, all the stickers in that box can go up there. <clears throat> so to understand what those ones and zeros mean is not easy. But if the program is so small, a programmer could do it, maybe in an hour. But when the program gets bigger, like this, figuring out what those ones and zeros mean starts to become a hard job. 
and for a real program where there are millions of ones and zeros, figuring out what they mean becomes terribly hard. So hard that nobody ever tries except when they're except when someone is desperate as a last resort. So in order for users to truly have the possibility of changing the software, they need to have the source code. And so that is part of the definition of freedom one. The users must have the source code. These two freedoms together give us separate control of the program. Here are four users, each one using the same program, and each one is free to change per copy. So here's one user that's actually changing per copy and three other users that are using it without changes. Well, this means that I'm free to change my copies and you're free to change your copies and you're free to change your copies, but only separately. This is essential, but it's not enough because most of the users don't know how to program. They do other kinds of things in life, but they still deserve control of their computing. How can non-programmers have control of their computing? Through collective control, which is the freedom for a group of users to work together, to collaborate, to exercise control over what that program does. So here we see a group of three users that are collaborating to change this program. Two of them on the right are touching the code. They must be programmers. The third one on the left is not touching the code. Maybe that user is not a programmer, but does participate in control of the program through the discussions of these three users about what changes to make. So that's the only way that I know of that a non-programmer can exercise control over the software a person uses. <clears throat> those who cooperate in this way are those who choose to. Nothing ever forces you to work with other users, but you can if they also want to work with you. So here are two more users at the bottom who are not working with that group of three. Maybe tomorrow they could start working together. It's up to them. Collective control requires two more essential freedoms. Freedom two is the freedom to make exact copies and then give or sell them to other users when you wish. And freedom three is to make copies of your modified versions and give or sell them to others when you wish. These two freedoms make it possible for the group to function because when one member of the group makes a modified version, with freedom three, person can make copies and distribute them to others in the group. And they, with freedom two, can make co more copies and distribute them to others in the group. But the group does not have to have a formal existence or a list of members. Whichever users are cooperating, that's a group. So, in fact, you can redistribute these copies to anyone. You can even offer them to the general public, meaning publishing that version. Anybody that has a copy is free to do that. So when the program comes with these four essential freedoms, it's free software because the users have control of that program. But if any of these freedoms is missing or incomplete, then the users do not control the program. Instead, the program controls the users and the owner controls the program. So this program, because it is non-free, in English we call it proprietary or user subjugating software, this non-free program generates a system of unjust power, power for the owner over the users. That's why every non-free program is automatically an injustice. This is why non-free software should not exist. 
We should not tolerate it in our lives. The way to be free is to kick out the non-free software. Well, this is the this is the first injustice, the basic injustice of any non-free program. And because of this, you should never develop non-free software. To develop non-free software is to build more injustice, to give some owner power over others. It's because of this, if you have the choice to do nothing at all or develop non-free software, you should do nothing at all because that way you're not doing wrong. To develop non-free software is doing wrong to society and you shouldn't do that. <clears throat> but this injustice typically leads to other injustices because nowadays the owner knows it has power over people and that exposes it to temptation to take advantage of that power to mistreat the other people, the users of the program, by putting in malicious functions. For instance, they spy on users. Many non-free programs send data about the user, what the user is doing or who the user is or various things, what's happening in the computer. They have no right to get this information. It's an injustice to take it. This example is the Amazon swindle o engano de Amazon. It, it spies on everything the user does and sends that to Amazon servers. For instance, it sends the title of the book. It sends the page number. If the user highlights any text, if the user enters any notes, it's all sent to Amazon. Total surveillance. But many other things do it too. All the commonly used proprietary operating systems, Windows, Mac OS, Android, iOS, and Chrome OS, they're all spying. Flash Player spies on the user. And many apps spy on the user. Even the flashlight app that just turns on the light spies on the user too. We know this because it sends data to some website and the only possible motive for that is spying. It doesn't need to ask for any information to know how to turn on the light. Apps, many, many apps spy on the user somehow, but in particular streaming apps and transportation apps spy on the user. <clears throat> Streaming apps require, typically require users to identify themselves and then they work with one particular server and that server keeps track of what each person has looked at or listened to. This is an injustice. This should be illegal. They should not be allowed to know or keep any record of who has watched what. So, I will never use Spotify because to use Spotify, you have to run a non-free program and it keeps track of you. So, I say, out, out, damned Spotify. <clears throat> and similarly for Netflix, I will never use Netflix. I won't even listen to something through Spotify or watch through Netflix with someone else's computer doing it. Because they have, it's a bad thing to spy on people and I don't want to be spied on. Transport apps are similar like Uber. I won't use Uber because I won't run the non-free app and I will not identify myself to get a ride. 
with an ordinary taxi, you don't have to say who you are. And you can pay cash, so it's anonymous. That's the ethical way. We, society cannot maintain freedom and democracy if there's a database of who goes where. So we must not allow that database to exist. We must put an end to Uber. We must get rid of Uber before it gets rid of our privacy. Now, Uber is not merely bad itself. Uber's strategy is to destroy all its competition. Uber runs at a loss every year. And these very low prices are meant to destroy all competitors. And then Uber figures once all the competitors are gone, it will be able to raise the prices again and replace all the drivers with robots. And it, everyone will be forced to use Uber. Well, if we're smart, we will fight Uber now and prevent it from ever getting there. That's what I hope you will join me in doing. Reject Uber and any other such service that requires people to run a non-free program or identify themselves. They should be, I think they should be required by law to support anonymous use, just as taxis do and have for many decades. <clears throat> Attaching a product to a, a specific server is quite common. There are many things you can buy for your house if you're a fool. It's called the Internet of Stings or the Internet of Spies, Cheaters, and Telemarketers. <clears throat> the Fitbit was the first example I know of. The Fitbit transmits personal data to the company, and then the company offers to sell it back to the person who's gener who generated it, basically saying, be a sucker. Basically, almost all of these products spy on the user. There's a home security camera, supposedly to let you watch what's going on in your home. But the only way to connect to the camera is through the manufacturer's server, which means the manufacturer is watching everything that goes on in your home. And who knows what it will do with that information? Give it to the government? Every, every minute of the day, who knows? Um, but a few months ago, the company said, starting today, you have to get an account and identify yourself. You see, the company can change the rules at any time by changing what's done in its server. So all of these products are totally untrustworthy. And there's a sex toy, a sex toy that can connect to the internet and receive remote commands from somebody else. Well, that might be a nice idea, but as soon as I heard about that, I could predict what nasty things that company could do. And it turns out it was even worse than I expected. The company indeed was spying on the users and recording what commands the users were sending. But not only that, they built the device for the purpose of spying. They put in a thermometer. Now, why do you need a thermometer in your sex toy? You don't. But they want a, a thermometer so that they can tell when the device is in contact with a human body, and perhaps how it's in contact with a human body also. So the device was built for the purpose of spying. It was not an afterthought. It was the purpose of the project. You must never trust any device that is going to talk over the internet. A pr an appliance for your house that, is, that has a computer in it, it should talk only directly to your computer with a documented protocol and you should be very careful. 
if the software in it is not also free. In other words, don't take any images, anything else generated, any data files generated by the product and show them to anybody else because that could be carrying surveillance data about you in a way you can't detect. <clears throat> And then there is the functionality of refusing to function, DRM. <clears throat> this means that the product is designed to stop you from doing what you want to do, like copying the data on a disk. So this is malicious software also. And all of the widely used proprietary operating systems Windows, Mac OS, Android, iOS, and Chrome OS, they all provide the basis for DRM. DRM stands for Digital Restrictions Management, but we also, uh, we also call them digital handcuffs. <clears throat> I think that the companies that make or sell devices with DRM should be committing a crime. The executives should be put in prison for doing that. Then there are back doors. This back door is in the Amazon swindle. <clears throat> it's for remotely erasing books. In general, you can't tell that a program, a proprietary program has a back door because you can't study the source code and that's the only way to detect this by analysis. So the only way people find out is through observation. If you see the back door operating, then you know it's there. In 2009, thousands, Amazon deleted thousands of copies of a particular book remotely. Some users were reading the book and they saw it disappear, poof. And that's how we know the Amazon swindle has a back door for erasing books. And what was the book? It was 1984 by George Orwell. The most ironic possible choice. The book about a dictatorship that destroyed the books that it didn't like. <clears throat> There was a lot of criticism and Amazon had to make it disappear. So Amazon said it would never do this again unless ordered to by the state. If you've read 1984, that's not a very comforting promise. But it wasn't a promise at all. It was just a meaningless noise. It had no legal force. So a few years later, Amazon resumed remotely erasing books without even an order from the state. Well, we know that there is a, there is a back door in iOS for remotely erasing or remotely deactivating apps. And once they're remotely deactivated, it's impossible to turn them on again. They're effectively, they're virtually deleted. And Android has a backdoor for remotely erasing apps or forcibly installing apps. Google can forcibly install an app into any Android device. Google could write an app specially for you to do whatever things to you that it wants to do and forcibly in install that if you have an Android device. And then there is, well, sometimes a back door could be really dangerous. Suppose there are driverless cars and there's a back door to tell the car to go there instead of there. They could send a command to lock the doors and take you to police headquarters where you're going to be tortured and no one will ever see you again. Now, we know that China will do this. We can be pretty sure that Turkey will do this. Will the United States do this? 
will Brazil do this? We can't be sure they won't. So we mustn't trust a computer-controlled taxi which has a back door and they're already designing the back doors. You know, they're not going to be autonomous. They're going to be connected, subject to remote control. I've posted a link to an article about the development of this remote control software. It's not speculation. There's also censorship. The iPhone was the pioneer in censorship of apps. Apple designed it so that users were not free to install the applications of their choice. They could only install applications <clears throat> approved by Apple. And Apple used this censorship power arbitrarily based on its business interests and its political positions until about a year ago. China ordered Apple to start blocking VPN applications and Apple just had to obey because Apple had given itself the power to control the users China could order Apple to use that power to censor for China. If Apple had not built in censorship power into these devices, then China could not have done that. China could have said, Apple, block VPN applications. And Apple could have responded, oh, we can't control what users install. There's nothing we can do. But because Apple grabbed for power, Apple made itself into a puppet of China. And probably Turkey and Saudi Arabia and any other tyrannical state that wants to impose censorship. <clears throat> there are also universal backdoors. A universal backdoor can forcibly change the software remotely. Windows has a universal backdoor. It was first discovered in Windows XP. By analyzing some of the output, experts could were able to prove that Microsoft had the power to forcibly change the software in Windows XP. Microsoft did not acknowledge this for Windows XP, but with Windows Vista, Microsoft proudly announced that it had this power, but with a different name. It's called Auto Upgrade, which is another name for the same power, the power to forcibly change. What are you talking about? I'm supposed to have until 3 o'clock. So basically, if you use a system like this, I can't understand those gestures. I'd never learned sign language, I'm sorry. So basically, every Windows user is completely under Microsoft's heel at all times. Do you think the Brazilian government should use Windows? Do you think anybody should use Windows? Obviously not. Uh, now, sometimes one program has several malicious functionalities. The Netflix app has the chains of DRM, and it spies on the user, and it also requires users to agree to a malicious anti-socializing contract a contract where the user agrees never to share copies, never to lend a copy to someone else, never to give a copy to someone else. Now, this is monstrous. It's basically saying, I agree to be a bad member of society, a bad part of my community. Now, 
when you've made a promise to someone else to mistreat others, you still, you can't do it. You have no right to act that way. You have to break the promise. You're morally obligated not to do what that contract says. <clears throat> because the contract is no excuse for acting that way. But I don't like to agree to a contract knowing I'm going to be obliged to break it. So I don't agree to them in the first place. I've never agreed to a contract like that. I actually read the terms and conditions of websites because I very rarely even think of accepting them. So I can actually have time to read them. And usually I think, this is disgusting. I won't agree. By the way, Microsoft does another nasty thing to its users. When it discovers a security flaw in Windows, before fixing it, it shows the flaw to the, to the NSA, the exploit, so that the NSA can enter everybody's computers. Do you think the Brazilian government should use Windows? Ah, thank you. Could you open it? Thank you. Uh, so we don't know whether other companies do that. We know in the case of Microsoft, for, thank you, for the other, case, other companies, we just don't know. Maybe they do or maybe they don't. Well, I've shown you a few examples. But we have hundreds of examples. In gnu.org slash malware, we have lists of these examples, and they're enough to show that if you use proprietary software, you're using proprietary malware. You're already being dragged along behind the bus. So you ought to stop. So why do they do this? They found ways to make more money by mistreating their own clients. Now, any program can be distributed as free software. And any program can be distributed as non-free software. In fact, any program can be distributed as free software and as non-free software in parallel. Because the difference between free and non-free is about how the program is made available for use. It's not about what's in the code, not directly. That's why any program can be released as free software and can be released as proprietary software. So by contrast, the difference between malware and honest software is a matter of what the code says, what the program will do when it runs. And these are independent. How it's released and what's in the code are independent in principle, but in practice, so they're independent in principle, but in practice, they're correlated. Because free software is almost always honest, and proprietary software is very often malware. And there's a reason for this. It's because the proprietary developers have power over the users, and they know it. So they feel the temptation to take advantage of their power by mistreating the users. They know that if they do this, the users are helpless. The users can't fix it. There's nothing they can do. So, um, so they do it. And the moral standards in proprietary software have gone down, down, down. They've gone, they've gone down through the floor. So there are thousands of proprietary programs, and most of them I don't know anything about specifically. I suppose there are a few that are honest, but we can't identify them because we can't check them. 
We have no way to look at a proprietary program and determine if it doesn't have any malicious functionalities. So the only way to trust a proprietary program is with blind faith. Typically blind faith in a company that already has proved it doesn't deserve any faith or trust. But with free software, you can have a rational basis for trust because you know that the user community has ultimate control. If the developers do something bad, the user community can fix it. And you know that there are programmers who look at that code sometimes, and if they see something bad, they'll tell everybody and they'll fix it. So this is the only known defense against malware. In all of computing, there is no other way to protect yourself from malware except this, that the users have control. In other words, it's free software. This is not a perfect defense, it's not guaranteed, but it's much better than being defenseless. The users of, of a proprietary program are defenseless always. So if you use a proprietary program, you're asking to be had. What you need to do is escape and, c and hello? Uh, escape and come to the free world that we have built. We built it with the GNU operating system and the Linux kernel, which are used together. I started developing GNU in 1984, and the specific reason was to make it possible to use a computer in freedom, meaning with no non-free software installed. And we achieved this in 19, that's funny, the numbers are gone. The numbers are not showing up, strange. Well, basically I started GNU in 1984 and in 1991 it was complete except that there was no kernel. In 91 Torvalds released the kernel Linux but it was non-free. However, in 92, he made it free. And so we were able to combine Linux with the almost complete GNU system to make a complete free operating system. You could actually run a PC with free software. So this is the GNU slash Linux system. You'll find lots of people that call it Linux because they want to write us out of history. We are too radical for them. We talk about freedom and they don't like that. So by diminishing our role in the development of the system, they can pretend our ideas were not important, but our, our ideas are the most important thing. In order to have freedom, you need to understand freedom and demand freedom and fight for it. So please give us credit for the GNU system. When you're talking about this combination, please call it GNU slash Linux or GNU con Linux. Now in principle, the GNU slash Linux system is a free operating system but not complete, not in, in practice, it's not always free. And the reason is there are lots of distros, variants of GNU slash Linux. Each distro has its own development team and they decide what to put into their distro. And if they put in some non-free programs, they have a system that's not entirely freedom respecting. Now the sad thing is, there are thousands of non-free distros and about 10 free distros. Look at gnu.org slash distros for the details and choose a free distro and choose a machine that will run a free distro. And basically 
why would a machine not run a free distro? Because it has hardware whose, whose commands are secret. <clears throat> the manufacturer is stopping us from writing free software for it. So if you want freedom, get a machine that doesn't have that problem. Look, you look in fsf.org slash resources slash hw for that kind of information. <clears throat> now, how do you make a program free? You do it by putting on a free license. What, why does a free program need a license? Well, under today's copyright law, every program is automatically copyrighted. Uh, I'm going to try sitting over here. So, copyright law by default prohibits copying the program, changing the program, redistributing the program. In some countries, it even prohibits running the program. Because to run it, you have to copy it into memory. <clears throat> and, well, how then do we make a program free? It's done by a formal legal declaration by the copyright holders of the program, which gives every user the four freedoms. And that declaration is called a free software license. So it's the license that makes the program free. The license is not merely informational. It has a legal effect. It's because that license is there that the program is free software. So never fail to put in a license. But you, because the license gives the users their rights, they need to know exactly what the license is. It's vital that they know. <clears throat> so you should put a license notice at the top of every source file. The license notice doesn't contain the license, but it says which license applies. So if you're using the GNU GPL, you put a copy of the GNU GPL into a file in the directory, and then on each source file you say, this code is released under the GNU general public license. And see the file copying for a, for a copy of the license. That way you only need one copy of the license, but every file has a notice to tell the users which license applies to it. And that notice does another important thing. It says which license versions apply. You see, the way we design for upgrades of the GPL is the license notice in the source file says to users, you can use this code under GPL version 3 or later. That's what, we'll, if we ever have to make a GPL version 4, and so far we don't have a plan to do so, but suppose in 20 years they change copyright law and we have to change the GPL. We'll make a GPL version 4. And then if the program says, GPL version 3 or later, users will be able to use it under GPL 4. But if the notice says GPL 3 only, then users will not be allowed to use it under GPL 4, and the only way to change that would be to find every contributor and get permission. So, it's really important to allow for license upgrading. Creative Commons has a different approach. Creative Commons, which started about 17 years ago, in each Creative Commons license, it says users can use a later version of the same license. So the 
the people who publish under a Creative Commons license, they don't have a choice to make. If you release something under, say, uh, CC by SA version 4, and someday there's a version 5, every user will automatically be allowed to use version 5. But I wrote the version 1 of the GNU GPL back in 1989, when the very idea of having multiple versions of a license was a radical thing. And I thought I needed to give each developer the choice of whether to permit upgrades or not. Well, unfortunately, that turns out to have created a problem. There are programs that say GPL version 2 only. There are programs that say GPL version 3 only. GitHub has misled people about licensing and people often chose GPL 3 only because they didn't understand their, what, what the choice was about. And so now we have a problem of license incompatibility in the future. Please permit license upgrades. If it's okay with Creative Commons, it should be okay with the Free Software Foundation. <clears throat> so there are two basic categories of free licenses. Actually, there are other kinds as well, but I only have time to mention the two main categories. There are the weak licenses and there are the copyleft licenses. The weak licenses say, do whatever you like with this code. Just keep my name on it. The Apache license is an example of a weak license. Well, it gives users the four freedoms. Apache is free software, but it permits too much. It permits companies to take all the code and put it into a non-free program. So that's what IBM did. It made a, a modified version of Apache, which is non-free, and the users of that program have the code of Apache, but they don't have the freedom of Apache. Well, in 1985, I had seen something like this. I knew that this was a possible danger. So I decided to prevent it by inventing copyleft, izquierdo autoral. And the idea of copyleft is to say, use this, but respect other people's freedom also. Copyleft means there's a condition on freedoms two and three about how you redistribute. It says, when you redistribute a copy, whether it's modified or not, you must pass on the same four freedoms to the downstream users. So the condition is on each middleman, the middleman must pass along the same freedoms by distributing under the same license and providing the source code. <clears throat> The GNU General Public License is our implementation of copyleft. We also have a couple of other variants which are also copyleft licenses. <clears throat> and the result is that... Uh-oh, is this mic dying? Companies often cooperate intentionally with the developers of the free program to put their enhancements into the free version everybody uses. Because that way, the company knows its changes will be widely distributed in the, in the community. So it... There another one? It's dying, give me another one. Just because it's working for right now doesn't mean the battery's got real charge in it. Thank you. Hello? Yeah. So, unless your program is pretty small or there are other very special circumstances, you should release every program under GNU General Public License version 3 or later. 
take a look at gnu.org slash licenses slash license dash recommendations dot html. That's our guide for how to choose a license based on the circumstances and the characteristics of your work. By the way, those of you who are leaving, there should still be stickers up there and GNU merchandise to buy. <clears throat> now, watch out when you visit a website because the web pages might contain non-free software written in JavaScript to install into your browser and then silently it's running non-free software and it won't tell you. Well, any non-free program takes away your freedom, so we developed Libra.js, whose purpose is to prevent non-free JavaScript programs from running. It's an add-on for Firefox. It has one other convenient feature. It'll show you if there's any non-free blocked JavaScript, and will also, slightly separately, it will search heuristically through the site for how to contact the webmasters so that you can just click on a button and immediately type in a message to the webmasters saying, I can't use your site. It tries to run non-free JavaScript code. That's treating users wrong. Please fix your site to work without JavaScript so I can use it. And no, I don't care if it's slower that way, because it respects my freedom more, and I want it even if it's slower, because my freedom is important to me. So one of the obstacles to freedom is the term open source. Sad to say, <laughs> I see, nothing very important. Just put, please put it aside for now. I don't want it up where it might fall on me. So, not everybody thinks freedom is something we should fight for. In the 1990s, in the free software community, there was a a political disagreement between two camps. There, was the, there were the free software movement, those of us who really cared about freedom and we were working for the sake of freedom, and then there were the others who uh, didn't care about freedom, but they were part of the community and some of them contributed to free software. Well, in 1998, the people in the other camp coined a different term, open source, so that they could stop even hinting at the existence of the free software movement. With their term, open source, they never suggested that freedom is the issue. And they then developed a different discourse, one which doesn't refer to freedom or right and wrong. It only talks about practical benefits so it's a different discourse based on different values, fundamental disagreement. For instance, boy, so many people are going. What's happening? What? Oh, the sun. I see. So you just have to move to a different seat. Well, that makes sense. I never was a fan of sun anyway. Uh, but, so where we say we demand freedom, everybody deserves freedom, if you develop and release a program, it's your moral obligation to respect the user's freedom to change and redistribute that program. The open source people don't say that. That's the last thing they would ever say. Instead, they say, if you develop and release a program, please consider whether, whether it's in your practical interest 
to let users change and redistribute the program because maybe they will improve the quality of the code, which is morally a very weak position, but they choose it because it's weak. <clears throat> well, most of the community was on their side their view is less radical, easier for people to adopt, and especially for businesses to adopt. Almost all of the businesses in the free software community during 1998 started saying open source. So since then, the major media say open source. The technical press says open source. They don't talk about free software. So we have to talk about it. That's when I started giving lots of talks every year to tell people about the free software movement because otherwise it could be forgotten entirely. And we can't win freedom if we forget about freedom. So we need your help. Every time you want to talk about this field, you can call it software liberty or you can call it open source. If you say software liberty, you're supporting our movement. If you say open source, you're helping to cover up the existence of our movement. So what you do has an influence and you're free to do to say what you believe. But if you support the free software movement, please show it to people every chance you get always say software liberty. Now, another obstacle is hardware whose specifications are secret. They will sell you the product and they refuse to tell you how to run it. Instead, they say, here's this non-free program, this driver or firmware, run it and shut up. But we can't do that. We should never have a non-free program installed on our computers. So what we need is reverse engineering. We need somebody who is smart and clever to analyze how the software talks to the hardware, to figure out the commands of the hardware, to figure out the interface spec. And giving that to someone else, someone can write a free program to do that job. If you want to make a big technical contribution to the advance of freedom, do reverse engineering. It's also a good career. There's a lot of demand and not very many people are good at doing this. So ask your university to start teaching reverse engineering techniques. Um. <clears throat> But if you want to make the biggest possible contribution, it's not technical. Become a free software activist and give speeches like this one. Spread the word, educate people that there's an issue of freedom here. And speaking of universities and schools of all levels, they are ethically obligated to teach only free software. A school should never teach the use of a non-free program. When I say school, I mean all levels from kindergarten to university and postdoctoral and education for adults. And when I say teach, I don't mean only formal instruction. I mean anything the school does to lead students to using certain software and getting them accustomed to certain software, the school should make sure that that's only with free software because the school has a social mission to educate good citizens of a society that is strong, capable, independent, cooperating, and free. <clears throat> I've heard that Recently, it was the anniversary of the freeing of slaves in Brazil. Well, proprietary software is a kind of subjugation as well. And we have to put an end to that. And schools must help put an end to that. 
they must never teach a non-free program because that's like, that's teaching dependence. It's like teaching kids to use addictive drugs. They must never do this. And I mean this literally. Technology today is, or, when it's proprietary software, is designed to be addictive because the developers have the power and they know it. But with free software, it's not designed to be addictive because the users don't want that and the users are in control. Every aspect of, of software will become corrupt if it's proprietary. But there's also moral education. The school has the mission of teaching people to be good members of their community, to help others. This is education and citizenship. Therefore, every class must have this rule. Students, if you bring a program to this class, you may not keep it for yourself. You must share copies with everyone in the class that wants them, including the source code because this class is a place where we share our knowledge. Therefore, you're not permitted to bring a proprietary program to this class unless it's for reverse engineering. The school has to set a good example by following its own rule. It must bring only free software to class and distribute copies including source code to everyone in the class. But beyond that, there's also education of the best programmers. Every program embodies knowledge. If it's proprietary, it withholds that knowledge from the student. So it's the enemy of the spirit of education, and schools should not tolerate its presence. Because the school, above all, must show it is loyal to the spirit of education. But a free program offers its knowledge to the students. It supports education. And how do you learn to write good, clear code? You do it by reading lots of code and writing lots of code. Well, only free software gives you the opportunity to re read the code of large programs we really use. Then you have to write lots of code. But as a beginner, you don't know how to write a large program starting from zero. That's too hard for a beginner. So how do you learn to write good code for large programs? You do it by writing changes in large programs. Small changes at first, and then bigger changes. Only free software gives you the opportunity to write changes in existing large programs. So in order for the school to give the students the opportunity to learn to be good programmers, it has to be a free software school. If you are connected with a school, if you're a student or a teacher or an employee or an administrator or the parent of students, it's your responsibility to campaign to pressure that school to move to free software and get rid of the non-free software. To win this campaign is gonna take time, most likely, so try various approaches. Don't get stuck in one approach. And one thing you need to do is teach the other people connected with the same school about these issues so that they join the campaign and eventually it gets big enough that you win. Human rights depend on each other, meaning that if we lose one human right, it becomes harder to defend the others. Now that we use computing for so many important aspects of society, control of your own computing, in other words, free software, has become one of the essential human rights that we need in order to defend the other human rights. And sometimes that requires a sacrifice. Sometimes you just have to say, I'm not going to do it that way because that's non-free software. I'll do this job the other way.
even though it will take me more time or I'll have to think harder because I value my freedom enough to make a sacrifice. 20 years ago, I was told that there was an organization in Brazil called Quilombo Digital. And when people explained to me what a quilombo was, I thought, this perfectly makes the point clear. We have escaped from proprietary operating systems. We made our own place where we could live and not be enslaved by them. We need that same spirit today. We can escape from proprietary software. We We've already built a lot of the free software we need, but there's still some more that we need, and some of it needs to be more convenient. But by building it, we can make a place of freedom where everyone can come. And we can eventually put an end to proprietary user subjugating software. So how do you help our cause? There are many things we need. It's not just programming. Many people think, oh, to help the free software movement, I have to write programs. But I'm not such a good programmer. I hope someday I'll get better at programming and then I can contribute. Well, I, I'm glad they want to help, but they've made a mistake. Because programming is only one way to help us. If you're a good programmer, contribute to free programs. I suggest you work on 15 projects run by others before you try to start your own project. That way you'll know how to do it well. But if you're not a programmer, look at what you can do. You can organize to campaign for free software. You can become a speaker, for instance. Tremendously important. You can be one of the group's organizers who keeps the membership list, arranges meetings, invites speakers, sends reminders, collects the annual dues, and so on. What you need for that is not brilliance. What you need for that is uh, painstaking reliability. Different people can do different jobs. You can persuade schools and government agencies to switch to free software. For schools, look at gnu.org slash education. For governments, look at gnu.org slash government. You can help other users. If you're an expert user, start a gnu slash Linux user group and help users there. Or if there's already a gnu slash Linux user group, you can go there and help users. If there's already a GNU slash Linux user group, but they mistakenly call it a Linux user group, you can go there and help users, but also explain why they should change their name so as to give us equal mention for the giant job that we started. And just by saying free software, software liberty, and not saying open source, you're helping us. Suppose you're on a mailing list and people are discussing which programs to use for a certain job. And somebody says, how about if we use open source? You can then come in and say, I'm not going to call this open source because there's more than practical, practical factors at stake here. We deserve freedom, and we have to respect other people's freedom, so we should use software liberty. We must use software liberty. And you know, suppose you don't win the, the, the argument. You will still have achieved something, because in addition to the five people who are posting in the, dis in the discussion, there are probably 50 more people who are just reading. And at, when you explain what free software is and why it's important, and you give them references to the most important articles on GNU.org, you're educating all those people. And that's very important, even if, and if you win the debate, that's a bonus. 
So there are a lot more kinds of work we need. Look at gnu.org slash help. You could join the Free Software Foundation. You can do it through fsf.org, or you can do it right here. I have a card you can fill out, and then you can pay your annual dues in cash, and I'll bring it back to Boston, and you'll be a member. <clears throat> but there are many other jobs listed in gnu.org slash help, some of them specialized jobs. Take a look. You'll find something that you can do. Slash philosophy contains many articles about political issues about free software. Slash licenses gives all the information like which licenses are free and which are not. <clears throat> slash GNU gives the history of the GNU project. Slash malware lists hundreds of examples of proprietary programs that are malicious and slash distros gives all the information about which distros are free and what our criteria are and so on. So now it's time for my other identity. Well, who here wants me to present my other identity? And who here would like more time for questions instead? Okay, it's very clear. I am Saint Ignatius of the Church of Emacs. I bless your computer, my child. <laughs> Emacs started out as a program, an extensible text editor, which I wrote, which was then extended so much by the users over the years that they could do all their computing without ever leaving Emacs. So it became a way of life. Then it became a church with the launch of the news group alt.religion.emacs, which you might find amusing to visit. In the church of Emacs, um, uh, we have a great schism between various versions of Emacs, and we also have saints, but no gods. Instead of gods, we adore the one true editor, Emacs. To be a member of the Church of Emacs, you must pronounce the confession of the faith. You must say, there is no system but GNU, and Linux is one of its kernels. <laughs> then, if you become a real expert, you can celebrate that with our ceremony, the Fubar Mitzvah, in which you recite a portion of our sacred scriptures, that is to say, the system source code. We also have the cult of the Virgin of Emacs, which means anyone who has never known or used Emacs. And according to the Church of Emacs, offering the opportunity to lose Emacs virginity is a blessed act. And we also have the Emacs pilgrimage, which means invoking all the commands of Emacs in alphabetical order. There is a breakaway Tibetan sect which claims that it's sufficient to do this automatically under control of a script. But 
the mother church holds that to uh, gain spiritual merit, you must type them by hand. The Church of Emacs has certain advantages compared with other churches I won't name. For instance, to be a saint in the Church of Emacs does not require celibacy. But it does require living a life of moral purity. You must exorcise whatever demonic proprietary operating systems have possessed computers under your control and then install a wholly free system where holy can be spelled in more than one way and then use and install exclusively free software with and on the system. If you make this vow and you live by it, then you too will be a saint and you have the right to wear a halo like this one if you can find one because they don't make them anymore. There is a traditional rivalry between Emacs and the other editor, VI. So people sometimes ask whether the use of VI is a sin. It's true that VI, VI, VI is the editor of the beast. But using a free implementation of VI is not a sin, it's a penance. A few years ago, I went to China and a VI user there proposed to attack me. I was shocked, but apparently violence begins with VI. People sometimes ask whether my halo is really an old computer disk. This is no computer disk, this is my halo. But it was a computer disk in a previous existence. Thank you. Now it's time for the auction. My halo has become rather attached to me. It's clinging when it shouldn't be sad. This is an adorable GNU that needs a home. is an adorable book that needs a home. So I'm going to auction them both together for the benefit of the Free Software Foundation. And here's how it works. The highest bidder can choose either the GNU or the book. So if you win the auction, you get whichever one you want. I can sign them. And if you have a penguin at home, you need a GNU for your penguin. There should never be a penguin without a GNU. So uh, I'm going to start with the regular price, which is 100 reais, $25. That's what it costs, each of them. So do I get 100 reais? Oh. If you're sitting over there or over there and you want to bid, I suggest you come to the middle so I can see you. And I should explain that I can accept payment in cash or with a bank card if it can make international purchases by phone or by Bitcoin if you have something here to pay with. Is there a bank machine in this complex? Does anyone know? What is that? What does that mean? No? Too bad. But I'll be answering questions for a while, so you have some time to go away and come back and get money. In any case, 
when you bid, please wave your arm and shout the amount so I can hear you clearly. Do I get a hundred highs for this adorable new or this adorable book? A hundred highs, anyone? Well, maybe I won't get a bid. That will at least make the auction very fast. How much? I can't hear anything. What? I got a hundred. Do I get one ten for this adorable thing? Do I get one ten guys? One ten for this adorable GNU? 110 to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom. Last chance to bid 110. Last chance to bid 110. How much? I can't see anything or hear anything. What? Can somebody tell me what he is saying? I can't. What? No, I've got a hundred already. I'm looking for a hundred and ten. Do I get a hundred and ten? Last chance to bid a hundred and ten or more. Last chance. Going, going, gone for one hundred. Please come up and pay. So, which one do you want? Okay, so now I'd like a hundred highs. Thank you. I will sign it after the questions. If you want me to sign it, I will sign it after I answer questions. So now it's time for questions. <clears throat> I have hearing problems. Too bad. But what that means is, what that means is to ask me a question, you need to come close and then speak loud and clearly and slowly. That way, I can hear your question. Hi, Richard. Speak more clearly. Hi, Richard. Now I can hear you. All right. Thank you very much for uh, everything you brought us. I'm kind of freaking out. Oh, those of you who are leaving, remember there are stickers up there and there is GNU merchandise up there. I'm kind of freaking out now because I'm just a regular user. I have an Android and I have a PC with a GNU with Linux. Lose, though. Oh, you with have GNU a PC Linux. with GNU and Linux. Yeah, well, but, but I, I'm not very advanced, and uh, I don't know how to act now. Like, I want to be free, but okay, I the see that the path to freedom is kind of... Are you talking about short-term or long-term? Because uh, in the short-term, you can learn more about how you can free yourself partly today. But in the long-term, the way to be free is to do work for the movement. So look at gnu.org slash help, and you'll see various ways to work. You can also find local organizations to work with. But don't work with open source organizations, because they don't talk about freedom. Yeah, uh, but for to vote in Brazil, we have to put our digital impressions, for instance. That's, that's an injustice. You know. But the worst thing about those voting machines is you can't trust them. They're using computers, which means they can be they can be fiddled with. They can rig the election that way. They've got to go back to paper. Voting must be on paper. That's the only system that we can actually trust. But uh, what can I do now to not be to be in charge of my fingerprints and of my well, identity? 
There's, since I have okay. friends on Facebook. Please, and please, please. So it depends. You see, you're making the question too broad, so broad it doesn't make any sense. Right. Each issue you have to look at separately. What do you do about Facebook? Delete your account. Stop being used by Facebook. Tell your friends, these are the ways you can talk with me. I still want to talk with you, but it's not going to be through Facebook. Sometimes you have to be firm and you have to say, I'm going to choose freedom for myself. I'm going there because freedom is there. I hope you'll come with me, but I'm not going to stay here for you. But you know, in each area, the question is different. All right. How in the case of Android, there is a free version of Android called Replicant. Look at replicant.us. Okay, uh, just to conclude then, uh, how can I be free economically using free software? I don't know what free economically means. It I'm means sorry. to raise enough money to pay my bills oh, and survive it, first of using all, free a, software. Don't, don't call that being free. Freedom is not making money. No, that's not, they're not the same thing. Please don't distort things. Uh, depending on what what area you're in, it's maybe trivially easy to make money and use free software. Uh, the, but the main thing is you shouldn't develop any proprietary software because that's directly in trying to subjugate others. Now, I am very firm about this. I won't use non-free software. Now, I'll, but that's a matter of when I'm running the software. I'll use a kiosk. I don't have to know what software is in the kiosk because it's not my kiosk. I'm just doing business with somebody. And if, if the company I'm doing business with runs non-free software, that's too bad for the company. I hope the company frees itself. But in the meantime, I don't have to boycott it just for that. So I just use the kiosk. What matters to me is what data is it going to get from me? And who is going to get that data? Well, if it's a bank machine, I do want my bank to know my name. So I have no reason not to use the bank machine. Hi, Rishi. Uh, historically, uh, people who wanted freedom always had to pay a very high price. So, and the kind of slavery that you find against it's much more subtle than That's previous right. one. So and do the you think price you have to pay is not so high. They're not killing people for rejecting windows. Yes, uh, uh, but in, on, the other, on the other hand, the slavery is much uh, harder to detect the hazards of it. So do you think a free software movement is ever going mainstream or it's always will go? Uh, it's a silly question. Kill That's them. a silly question. Do I, I don't think no, it's a any question que is silly. It's a silly question because, A, I don't know the future any better than you do, but what I do see is that questions like that are an invitation to, for a self-fulfilling prophecy. And what I know is if we fight, we may win, or we're likely to win more. And if we give up, we're going to lose. So the important question is, what should we do today? And I can't know the answer to how much we're going to win in the future, but I can know the answer to what we should do today. Uh, hello. Uh, I've been watching to your presentation, and I've been thinking, in a prison world of uh, artificial intelligence and... I'm afraid I don't hear all the sounds in your words, so I can't tell the words. <laughs> Sorry. Please try to pronounce each sound more carefully. Okay. Uh, in a crescent world, world of uh, in artificial intelligence and neural networks, how do you see the free software inside of those? Oh, well, there is free software for deep learning. A lot of good programs are free software. And then when it, then of course to use it, you need a trained neural net. 
you can make a trained neural net from a big training database, but what if the database is secret? What if you only get the trained neural net? It turns out that if you don't like what the trained neural net does, you can change it. There are programs that will let you alter the trained neural net by giving it the patterns where you want it to act differently. You don't need to train it starting from zero, which means that it, you don't need to insist on getting the original training database. You have the ability to change it, meaning that you know, there's an obvious idea that Oh, an obvious way to think about these trained neural nets, which turns out to be mistaken. The obvious idea is the training database is the source code and the trained neural net is the executable. But it turns out that's not how it is. For a lot of purposes, you can treat the trained neural net as just as good as source code. It's sort of both the executable and the source code. And this is because we can modify it based on the, how we want it to act differently. So this is a fortunate thing. It means that in practice, if you want to run an AI, then getting the uh, trained neural net is not as free, is not hard. Now this doesn't mean everything's going to be totally easy. What it means is we don't have an insuperable problem right at the beginning. Um, hi, Stalman. And what you, do you think about the lot of registers of uh, in Linux you have uh, recently, like uh, Ubuntu and then what other about registers? Them? What about them? Uh, what do you think? And some time ago when he knew Linux and has made, we, ha we have not so many distros like you we mean, have okay, today. I wanna, do I, you're asking what do I think about the number of distros? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So let me answer. Basically, I think it's a dispersal of effort. Don't make another distro. Help people develop one of the existing free distros. Let's concentrate the effort and then we'll get better free distros. So hi, uh, I was the guy responsible for talking to you in the first campus party you came here from, uh, to Brasilia. Uh, and I contacted you to develop the Librify.js that works integrated with Librify.js to Librify the dailyquals.com and these I'm afraid I can't hear what you're saying. Oh, so, could, <laughs> sorry. Come talk to me after, but right now, could you ask your question? All right. Uh, so, I'm trying to make my better to free software really gets to the people in the right way here in Salvador, in Bahia. And I can't know how can I develop these better because... Develop what better? Uh, develop my ideas better because oh, there is ideas. no, no uh, free well, Salvador Foundation. You know? It's not... Well, you, you can work on free software projects anywhere in the world. You don't need a free software foundation right here to be able to work on whatever. But here's the thing, it sounds like you want to advance the movement. Maybe it would be good to join others and start a Salvador free software activist group. And uh, together, look for opportunities to spread the ideas, to convince others and to convince institutions to change. At any kind of institution, like maybe you can convince some bank to allow people to do online banking without running any non-free JavaScript code. Thank you. Hello. Uh, how do you think we can re-educate your child and our students to learn about free software? Because there was a rejection. Well, are you a teacher in the school? Yeah, kind of. Well, then just start teaching them yeah. these ideas. There are two things to teach. One is the ideas of the free software movement, and the other is use free software. And you can, you can do this the way you teach anything, 
And one th but when it comes to the practical stuff, you should use free software, and you should encourage them to use free software. A lot of school in Brazil has the have the free software, but there's a rejection because they were born in the system. There has Instagram. I don't have any magical solution for yeah, that. Yeah, I'm asking. So there's a. What do you think about? We I don't can know. Do? I know, but there are schools where they mainly use free software. Yeah. I have never taught in a class, mm. right? So you're asking to some extent the wrong person. But mm. if you look at gnu.org slash education, you'll see some examples. And the other thing is, if you show a clear idea of why non-free software is an injustice, and you show that you reject it personally, that will make some students think. Thank you. But you have to be prepared to say no. So if someone says, hey, can I, if a student asks, can I talk to you through Skype? Then you have to say, no, it's a non-free program. I don't run that. Okay. The crucial idea here is that a non-free program mistreats you, so you have to reject it. And you set an example by rejecting it, personally. Okay, hello, Mr. Salman. So, I saw that one of the new goals of the Free Software Foundation was to write a new, a completely free mobile operating system. So, where are you going? Where this old new OS, this new free OS, would run? Because current devices need non-free, non-free software to work. Okay. I have well, a, okay. Basically, a smartphone typically has two processors. I had to cut you off because I couldn't understand Sorry. what you were saying. I, it's My too bad. bad. But the point is, rather than I think I know what the topic is, so I can talk about it. There is the modem processor, which talks over the radio to the phone network, and there's the application processor, which is where Android would run. Well, we have a, a free replacement for Android, except it doesn't do all the things. So what this is called replicant, see replicant.us, but it needs to be improved. It's like GNU slash Linux in 1993. It needs a lot of work. So, uh, however, the big problem with the mobile phone is the non-free software in the modem processor, and in most phone models, that talks directly to the microphone and the GPS, meaning it can listen to you and track you, and it has a universal back door, so they can remotely change the software to make it listen to you, and they can even, in most models, they can overwrite the operating system in the application processor. So you could install Replicant and then one day discover that the phone company replaced Replicant with some version of Android that's non-free. So to fix that, we can't change that with Replicant because Replicant doesn't have control over this. It has to be fixed by making another model of phone and people are building that such a model of phone. So that phone doesn't exist yet, right? Well, it's being, it's in some stage of, of production, but I don't know the details. Uh, hello. Uh, Richard, what do you think about GPR? Is it an important step towards uh, users' control over the data? Yes. The GNU General Public License is what makes sure that all the users of the code get freedom. If you use a weak license, like the Apache license or one of the BSD licenses, and never say the BSD license because there's more than one, uh, then the, you can make the code free, your version will be free, but somebody else's modified and improved version might be proprietary. And so we're basically, by using weak licenses, you say to all these businesses, make my code non-free if you like. And that means we're not defending freedom for the users. 
the idea of defending the freedom for all the users is copyleft, and the way you do it is with the GNU General Public License. Are we finished? Okay. Happy hacking.